Welcome to the first Know the ISB seminar. So the whole idea here is, is to try to um, introduce the science community to the members of the ISB over time and give them an opportunity to, to share, you know, kind of in an open format what, what they would like and what they do back home, what they think about, those kinds of things. So, you know, yeah, good start. And, and we have Brian Atwater here to start it off. So as you may know, my name is Garrett, and I coordinate these events for the science program. And I'd like to thank you all here in attendance today, as well as those online, a handful of people that are on the WebEx. A few housekeeping um, comments before we get started. There'll be a sign-in sheet going around. So that's our, uh, our, our number one performance metric to make sure that, that we know this is a valuable, valuable enterprise. The shiny lures on the wall are the bathroom keys, and so if you need to use the bathroom, it's out the door to the left and around the corner. Please return the keys when you're done. Um, in case of emergency, calmly proceed. We'll all go out as a group down the elevators, out the east exit into Cesar Chavez Plaza. And from on the heels of our last talk, um, please, everyone on WebEx, mute your mics so we don't have to listen to your chatter or otherwise. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Atwater, who's a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. Brian's a man of many distinctions with a, a personal delta chronology that dates back a few decades. Um, a few highlights that Brian provided me, and then I, I added one that I couldn't leave off. So <clears throat> Brian, Brian said that he started off a lot of this, this thought process and work with um, studying mason jars from the California Division of uh, Bay Toll Crossings between 1974 and 1976. He shared a trailer below sea level with mice on a Jersey Island from 1977 to 79. Um, this is the one I added, and he'll probably blush, but he was one of Time Magazine's most, um, 100 most influential people in 2005, and that's very pertinent to today's talk because it was related to his, um, his book that he had, he had uh, published. The... <laughs> <laughs> I I I'd hoped that these the, the the facts that he had sent me would be embellished by him as I presented them, um, but that was related to his book, The Orphan Tsunami of 1700, which is is part of why we're all here and what we're going to be hearing about in general today. And then overall, he spent the last um, three decades mucking about here and there, as he put it, mainly in subduction zones, and then. His final point, um, which was a failure to resist joining the ISB in 2010, is, is ultimately our collective windfall, both for the presentation, the talk he'll be giving today, as well as, um, you know, his influence on the ISB and, and guiding the science process. So with that, Brian. For the lights, yeah, be good. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. Um, so those are my Delta parents, and uh, on the left, Helen Rumsey Buss was her maiden name, uh, born in, I, I guess I, what I want to say is that, that um, <clears throat> regarding invasive species, that most of us who work in the Delta are probably invasive subspecies of some sort, and, and my Delta parents were also that way. Helen was born in Provo, and she grew up in Palo Alto. Her father taught at what was then, I think, San Jose College, and she got a, a bachelor's degree in biology there in '42. And she wrote a, a master's dissertation on genetics of a a, a, a kind of a bread mold that doesn't have a, an amino acid called methionine at, at, and in 1944. That was her master's thesis. And she ended up on Jersey Island with Ted in 1947. Ted was, I think, a city kid, probably raised in San Francisco. <clears throat> and his father was in the telephone business. And there's some, I learned on the, on the web last night that things are not all completely uh, in the clear with his father, but Ted ended up being the executor of the will of his father, and his father's sister, no, his father 
had married the sister of of W. Q. Wright, and the Q is Quimby, which is a Delta Island name, and there's a Wright name uh, for Wright Elwood or something down the South Delta. So I think this is Wright, and Wright's father apparently had been in the Delta, and Wright, the W. Q. Wright was a uh, civil engineer, and there were some fractured business dealings between W. Q. Wright and Ted's father. <clears throat> And Jersey Island ended up in the estate. And in 47, I guess that much had been lost in the, in the Depression. In 47, Ted decided to make a go of it as a farmer in the Delta, having grown up in San Francisco. So those two transplants were there when I showed up in 76 or 70, 77, I think, and I was looking for a place to stay while doing uh, PhD research and uh, in the Delta as a, as a um, graduate student at University of Delaware. So the day after that picture is taken, it's pretty high water there. Um, the, there were two levee failures, Webb Island, um, just the big one just to the north of Frank's Tract, and then Holland Island apparently also went on the 18th. <clears throat> so this also kind of dates it. Some of you, um, how many of you got to stop on the Antioch Bridge for a freighter? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, so that's that I think is in '78, and and uh, this is in '79. So there's the same yellow pickup truck, and Ted's Ted's attitude with the levees was he'd take any any uh, material he could get. And so when he saw the Antioch Bridge, the old one being taken down, you can see in the backdrop the a little bit of the old bridge left underneath the high new, new span. So pieces of the old Antioch Bridge ended up on Jersey Point, the most exposed part of Jersey Island in terms of, of wind waves. And so set, Ted was there supervising the emplacement of this stuff. I looked last night on the Stewardship Council's maps of 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 the status of levees, and this is, uh, I think, is is rated at Jersey Point at the 84.99 standard. So, some of some of the old Antioch Bridge contributes at Jersey Point to the 84.99 designation. Okay, so there are the mason jars promised, and and so there was quite a racket for geologists. Um, from some engineers who uh, who wanted to build bridges across San Francisco Bay, and and the not in my backyard people said, "Not you're not going to end the, that that bridge in my neighborhood," and so the the bridges would end up not being built. But there were foundation studies, and they provided nice view of of geologic history at San Francisco Bay going back through the. The current interglaciation and into a pre and well through a previous one, volcanic ash from the Lassen Peak area from about 400,000 years ago showed up in some of these cores. So the 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 nice ball jar there is from uh, the so-called parallel crossing, which was to have been built parallel to the Bay Bridge, <clears throat> the foundation work done in uh, 48, I think, <clears throat> and. We were all younger at one point, I guess, so. Um, so I, as, as somebody digging around in the Delta, I got to see the remains of lots of these, lots of uh, remains like this, but not of, these are mostly modern ones, right? But when they get older, they uh, they get kind of rotten. And the, but the, so this is one of those big toolies that um, back back at that time was had a simpler name, Scirpus. It's now got some more German sounding name with more syllables. And 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 um there's this shiny black exterior to the rhizome and then the below ground stem and then inside are these vascular tissues that also tend to preserve pretty well. So you can you can do peat petrology with this, learn about the the kinds of plants that were living in the delta, but the, the spectacular productivity of these things is 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 a reason that the, that you have the the peat out there, right? So, um, 
This character here, Benjamin Franklin Mudge, was the mayor of Lynn, Massachusetts in the decade before the Civil War. And, and he belonged to a scientific society that talked about stuff, and, and, and he got interested in this thing called Romney Marsh. And he, uh, and his, let's see, I missed the button. Okay. So that's what he said about it in 1856. So, you know, he didn't know about sea level rise, but it doesn't matter. You can replace subsidence with submergence or some neutral term. Whether the sea rises or the land falls doesn't really matter to the plants. But this is probably an, an early state, the earliest statement of the process that's invoked to explain the thick peat in the delta, the peat that made it important for Ted Halsey to have pieces of the old Antioch Bridge put at Jersey Point, right? <laughs> but there's, um, there's, another, there's another angle with uh, marshes that you can use them as, as recorders of abrupt changes in relative sea level. And, and there's a lot, of, there are a lot of things in earth science that people try to do that's a, and call it original, but usually they find out that Grove Carl Gilbert did it already. And so this is the case with Gilbert. <clears throat> so this is a Gilbert photograph at Bolinas Lagoon, and the, the person standing there is Willis Jepson, who was the botanist at Berkeley. So Gilbert has a – it's okay. I, can, I think I can read this. This is just wonderful. Maybe – some of you know this. Um, it is the natural and legitimate ambition of a properly constituted geologist to see a glacier, witness an eruption, and feel an earthquake. The glacier is always ready, awaiting his visit. This is before global warming. Um, the eruption has a course to run, and alacrity only is is needed to watch. What does he mean by that? You got to get out of the way. Um, let's see. But the earthquake, unheralded and unheralded and brief, may elude him uh, through his entire lifetime. <clears throat> so Gilbert, you know, was. Um, well, he'd come to California, apparently, uh, enticed to the Sierra Nevada, interested in glaciers and granite and stuff. And he, landforms were really important for him. And, 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 but, but then the, the um, hydraulic mining debris issue uh, brought Gilbert into the, into the work. And Gilbert had a prior background in movement of, of sediment by running water. So he was interested in the topic, and he set up shop in – in um, in Berkeley, there. I promise not to say, quote this, but this is just too funny to not to mention. Um, he wrote to a friend in July 1905. I've been two months in the state of California, with headquarters at Sacramento, which place I find so dull that I've down slidden to billiards in a public billiard room. <laughs> If I spend the winter here, the base will probably be shifted to Berkeley, where there are people I like to know. <laughs> so this is one of those people, right, who was waiting for him, and the earthquake was waiting to happen. He's writing that in, in, in 1905, you know, right, right before. So, um, so this... This, this is what Gilbert noticed, and okay, it's a black and white photo, but I think you can see it, that on the right side, the, the pickle weed is lighter color than the left side. And he's out there one year after the earthquake, and Jepson went out and, and named all the plants on the, on the right side of the screen that, that were suffering. And a, a coast and geodetic survey 
map, a new map of Bolinas Lagoon made in the 1920s, shows no marsh on the right and marsh preserved on the left. So, you know, the, the sudden lowering, the sudden rise in sea level occasioned by down dropping um, did in the, the marsh. This is a Gilbert photograph from up high looking at what he called Tepper Island is out there. Let's see. If, and this is annotated. And then uh, um, <clears throat> a latter day uh, bit of research by Joel Berquist. Um, uh, concluded that the area between the, da the dashed lines got dropped down during the earthquake. They, he thought it was uh, um, the rocks underneath were being dropped down. It wasn't just a case of the ground shaking and the, the sand uh, kind of settling. But whatever the cause, um, it's out there at, at Pepper Island that, that, um, that Jepson was standing. <clears throat> okay, so that gets that gets to the subduction zones and 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 they're very good at making land go up and down and so now you can i mean you can you can think of marshes um, failing to keep their heads above water failing to meet mudge's criterion i should mention that that mudge marsh it's been studied uh, more recently that the average rate of submergence through the past couple thousand years there is is something like a millimeter a year or a bit less. And then in recent, in recent decades, that the rate has increased to a couple millimeters a year and the plant communities are shifting on the marsh in response <clears throat> and the mudge marsh, the classic one. But anyways, if you had mudge marsh, you, couldn't, you can't easily maintain mudge marshes at, at subduction zones. And so this, this Japanese public safety diagram meant to um, <clears throat> teach the association between earthquake and tsunami. And you can think of the 2011 disaster in Japan where you had 20,000 lives lost, but the, the survival rate is pretty high. It's like 95% of the people who were in the areas that got inundated survived. And some of that probably has to do with this message being driven home that earthquakes and tsunamis are associated. I think of that parenthetically in regards to deltas. I wonder, I mean, I was on Jersey Island during an earthquake in Livermore in the late 70s, early 80s, I can't remember. And, and I remember seeing the waves, the seismic waves rolling the peak ground out there. But I never thought to climb up to the top of the levee, you know. <laughs> but I probably should have. And I wonder how many people in the Delta know that, you know, if you feel an earthquake, you might want to get to the top of the levee. Anyways, um, <clears throat> so you have this observant cat, and you see the downgoing tectonic plate is dragging the overriding plate. And, and then the uh, caption at upper right says, says earthquake and tsunami. Um, and there's, there's something that's a little... That's that's left out here. That um, that's the okay. This plate's going this way, and this plate's going this way. And not only do you drag the leaning edge down, but you also shorten this plate. You make it thicker, and so you bulge it up where the cat is. And then when the earthquake happens, that bulge collapses. Or you could think of a rubber band that you've pulled. And, and the rubber band gets thinner. So the rocks are elastic enough, they can thin, and then the land drops. <clears throat> so that can give you a sea level rise from one of these. And that's what happened in 2011. Nearly all the coast facing the area that was overrun by the big tsunami in Japan had also undergone a lowering of land. Okay, so subduction zones are these plate boundaries that scattered around, mainly around the Pacific margin, and they curl around over in Indonesia. And there's something resembling a subduction zone off of off of um, off of Iberia, and then this little guy over here, Macron. And um, the color code here says what's the biggest earthquake that that seismologists, in most cases, know about. Um, and so if, if you've made this map before 19, 
1960, I guess there wouldn't be any red ones at all. And then in 1960, or 52, you have this very big thing up at Kamchatka that's close to magnitude nine. It's 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 during the Cold War. There was there was a, a big flurry of, of big earthquakes, and not until the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, did you start to get big earthquakes again. And and uh, and it's, but I mean it's really amazing. Most of the planet's seismic energy radiated in the 20th century was between the 52 Kamchatka and. 64 Alaska earthquakes, and the biggest of them all was down here in Chile in 1960. <clears throat> the um, the business of land going up and down, it's it's used to reconstruct earthquake history, um, most exactly in a way over here at um, off of Sumatra. There's some islands that are in the position where the 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 islands get dragged down during earth between earthquakes in the decades or centuries between earthquakes. People planted po coconut palms out there. They end up in seawater as the land gets dropped down, dragged down slowly. And then during the earthquakes, everything pops up some meters, and corals are left high and dry. So that's 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 the expression over there. The Chilean and expression, this one at Cascadia we'll talk about, and part of the Alaskan expression is, is the opposite one, the, the down drop during the earthquake. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> on this sketch map, the red outlines the approximate area of the fault rupture, and the blue, the area that, that got dropped down. So this earthquake happens five years before the term plate tectonics first appears in print. And the seismologists who first interpreted it said, ah, it was a vertical fault. Uh, and, then, and then particularly George Plafker, a, a geologist, went out and mapped all the shoreline changes and said, no way, you've got to have a gently inclined fault and have part of the part of this is the part that had been, been dragged down between the earthquakes and it pops up. And this is the part that got stretched like the rubber band. And so back near Anchorage, things get dropped down. So, so here's the first post-earthquake high tide uh, at Turnigan Arm near Anchorage, going streaming up, water's pouring upstream. This is a this, this is a macro tidal estuary, 10 meter tide range, um, <clears throat> and there's snow out here. There's cracks on the ground from the from the shaking, and um, cottonwoods. It's March, and then these, of course, are cakes of ice brought in from turning is just a forbidding looking thing. This is the remains of the highway that's being covered by as the tide comes across it. And then they, they put the railroad cars out over the over the bridge here. And nearby was this place called Portage. So the summer after the earthquake, a, a standard high tide is sitting in here, having flooded the garage. And with it the, the grove of spruce trees. And they're not very happy. So this picture taken in 1991 shows the gar garage still there, but the, the trees standing dead. So if you didn't have the eyewitness accounts to tell you 64 Alaska, that the earthquake had happened, that the land level change expressed by those trees is part of the clue. And here it is in 98. <clears throat> so by then, there were new uh, spruce trees in a rebuilt wetland out here. And the rebuilding took place very quickly because of that huge tide range. So there's your scale, the, the dark soil from 64, and, and the individual layers that are brought out here represent individual high tides. And there's a, di there's a daily inequality between them. There's a higher high tide and a lower high tide. And looking closely at these, you can see the diurnal inequality of the tides. You can also see spring neap cycles. So here's a set of, this gets in towards the neap cycles and neap tides. And finally, when you get far enough into the neap tides, the tides don't get high enough to cover this place at all. So you don't get every tide recorded here, but, but there's an, it, it is only a matter of months, probably, before 
this stuff was 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 filled back in here. So it's a very quick reconstruction. You think of San Francisco Bay with people worried about wetlands keeping their heads above water. Oh, and then I read this in a, in a levy a solicitation for levy work in the Delta this morning. It's, re, it's, it's called AAS, and that's anthropo, anthropogenic accommodation space. And accommodation space is something geologists like to use where you make room for sediment to accumulate. So the earthquake created, well, it's EAS, earthquake accommodation space, I guess. It created accommodation space because this land surface used to be way up there. It got lowered. The tides could come in. They could lay down their sediment, right? So it's like that. Okay, so that that was really helpful at another subduction zone, the one that's up here, Cascadia. And and um, <clears throat> helpful because uh, these very big earthquakes don't happen often. The, the predecessor to 64 Alaska was was back at least um, something like 900 years ago. And the predecessor to the 2004 Indian Ocean disaster was in the 13 or 1400s. The predecessor to the 2011 Japanese one was in July of 869. It's in Japanese written records. <clears throat> but you know, these things have, they don't happen very often. So, in a place like the Northwest, where Lewis and Clark show up in 18, you know, a little after 1800, it doesn't give you enough time for the faults to to show their hands. And um, <clears throat> and so this this compiler of maps for the King of France had the Spanish, I don't know, who are the people who ran up the Spanish coast? There's one, I can't remember. Well, I can't remember either names, but you know, there's one in the, in the 1540s and then, and then, and then um, <clears throat> up to, to Cape Blanco here. But they didn't know anything, and this is enlightenment, so if they don't know it, they're not going to invent it. So they just leave it blank. So, so this subduction zone is, is, Opposite polarity to the one in, with the cat in Japan, but otherwise kind of similar thing with an oceanic plate going under a continental one and some generic cities over there for good measure. And the, um, the, the issue when, when I, after I got, after I, after I left the Delta, I, mentioned, I mapped granitic rocks for a while and worked with Ice Age floods deposits in northeastern Washington, but moved to Seattle in 85. And just at that time, the question was being asked by geophysicists whether this fault can make really big earthquakes. And so these were the two ideas out there, that there was some magical lubricant or that it was really stuck. It was clear by then that the fault was active, and the problem was whether it made big earthquakes or not. And there was no smoking gun for it in historical time. So this is the this is what we saw at the Portage Garage, right? That you had trees there, and they go for a swim, and then the tides bring in sediment. We saw the the buried 1964 soil, and you can get good preservation of the organic matter down there. In the Alaskan case, there were the droppings that they call moose nuggets that were preserved on the top of the buried soil. So in, in, in Washington, we're blessed with this thing, western red cedar, that's a bit like um, redwood in, in, in containing preservatives. So the standing dead snags of, of trees that were killed 300 years ago, western red cedar, is still out there protruding through bra this brackish water tidal marsh. It's just north of Grace Harbor, this one. And this was a, this was a problem that um, attracted uh, researchers from a number of different places. It was pretty good. Um, there were people working their backyards, essentially. So I, I got to dabble in the Washington estuaries, and there were other groups working in Oregon and California. A group of British scientists came over to teach us how to do it right in Washington. They were very good, but they, they did, it, it was very helpful to have the sociology of this, having, having scientists want to shoot one another out of the water, but coming up with the 
essentially the set, you know, reaching the conclusion that, in fact, yeah, that the land had dropped abruptly and had done so repeatedly through thousands of years. So each of these dots represents an estuary, a Bay or River mouth, that has something other than a mudge marsh. I, mean, I remember I spent a good part of the summer of 1986 looking for mudge marshes at Willapa Bay in southwest Washington as a way to disprove the idea that these earthquakes happen. <clears throat> so, so that it was very helpful. Uh, you know, the, the it's it's one thing to read about mudge. It's another thing to work in the delta and core through lots of peat and see it un uninterrupted, and then and then find geology like this. So. Down here is the buried soil with some some spruce roots sticking out of it, and a big spruce root here from around the year 400, and then a pile of mud. There are some other wiped out buried soils in here, but then a very distinct one from 1700. And you just wouldn't you wouldn't see this in delta stratigraphy. <clears throat> so just stripping out the sea level rise component here and just letting the land go up and down in a cartoon fashion. The, the build up here is, is you end up with cycles, sort of a sawtooth graph. The uh, yellow bars, the, the, the bigger the bar, the more poorly I've done my job in dating the, 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 uh, the time of abrupt lowering of the land. Um, but the, the overall history is, is of marshes being converted into, or, or tidal spruce swamps being converted into into tide flats and then building back up kind of in the Alaskan way, but probably more slowly, but building back up, getting revegetated and waiting for the next earthquake to happen, which is kind of the situation out here. So not a mudge marsh. Um, <clears throat> there was some other evidence that helped out a lot that's also related to the land level changes. So this. The person in the pit here, uh, Kruan Jankow, is on the faculty of Chula Longhorn University. She did her doctorate in petroleum geochemistry in Scotland. So she she refers to small things as we, and and uh, and the, in the pit she's got 2,500 years of tsunami history, and the 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 top layer here is is um, is from the 2004. Tsunami, which ran about 10 meters deep at this site, and it ran across a freshwater marsh represented by this stuff. And then there was this is this thing from the 1300s or 1400s, and then still two earlier ones. And then you get down here into mangrove deposits, which is kind of their equivalent in Thailand of, or in a lot of tropical shores of our tidal marshes here. And they are absolutely hopeless for doing this kind of geology because they're riddled with crabs, and the crabs just mix everything. So, you, 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 the, this, it, we, this is a, this is a purely freshwater setting on a beach ridge plain in between beach ridges, and that's the reason uh, that the layers are preserved there. So, anyway, tsunamis can write their own histories too, and and on, on the Cascadia coast, that's helped by the land level change. Well, it's part and parcel land level change, right? The tsunami is generated by by warping, abrupt warping of the seafloor that lifts or, or drops down the column of seawater above it, and then gravity takes over and flattens things out, and you get the tsunami. And and so in this case, um, on the Cascadia coast, you get the lowering of the land, and then the tsunami comes across the freshly downdropped land surface, and it's picked up sand grains that lays them down, and then the mud builds up on top, as as it did at, at the Portage Garage. <clears throat> so. So at this, in this example, um, the mud of the tide flats is here. The, the soil of a marsh from salt marsh from 1700 is here, and then the stripes are from individual waves in the tsunami wave train. And there's a, there's a flopped over version of this grass. How are we doing? Thanks, Garrett.
Okay, let's see. But we killed our ability to advance. Try again. Good. Okay, school teachers from the Portland, Oregon area, middle school teachers um, at the same place we were just looking at, but now you're seeing the whole thing, the modern marsh here, the, the soil of the marsh from 1700 is there. And then this lovely stuff is a water-loving grout you can paint on the inside of a water well. Um, and it's been painted through nylon window screen and it soaks into the sand more than it soaks into the mud. So the teachers can take back to their classroom a piece and, and, and see the, the soil and the individual sand layers showing up there. <clears throat> so stuff really, I mean, if you saw this in the Delta, you, you know, it'd just knock your eyes out, right? I mean, you can, you can, you can, you can dig, um, going through this, my, my, I thought I'd lost all my Delta slides, but the night before last, I found them in the basement. And and so I found Ted and Helen with the levee, you know, in, in January of 1980 and so on. And and uh, and one of them was was a slide from from Sherman Island showing the sand from the fan of a of the debris from a levee break, you know, where the water pours through the break and scours makes those big scour depressions and then spreads sand out across the landscape. And so it's a very nice, it, it, was, it was essentially a tsunami on, on uh, uh, but not quite a tsunami, but still the same, sort of the same phenomenon. <clears throat> okay, so a lot of that kind of research was done in the, in the, in the, uh, 80s, late 80s and early 90s, and by by the mid 90s, it was clear that the whole length of the subduction zone, from well, at least up here in Vancouver Island down to the to the um, uh, uh, Eureka, California area, that it had broken. Uh, the fault had broken about 300 years ago, sometime between 1680 and 1720, <clears throat> but. What we couldn't tell from that evidence was whether it had broken piecemeal in a series like this or it broken all in the same few minutes of a giant earthquake. And that was just, that was just kind of an unavoidable ambiguity of the, of the uh, dating tools available. Radiocarbon dating doesn't let you get to the nearest minute, right? <laughs> so at that point we got some help from from Japan, and what what's covered at upper right says 1960 Chile. So that's what this picture's this picture's front of an effect of the tsunami that crossed the Pacific Ocean, taking 24 hours, um, going from uh, southern Chile from that very biggest earthquake of the 20th century, um, <clears throat> and it, it killed 53 people in this in this town, Ofunato. Um, and there were fatalities also in, along the way in Hilo, Hawaii, but of course most of the losses were in the near field in Chile. But this um, this took some Japanese researchers by surprise, and so it sent them back to to the sources they were using, like um, diaries or 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 um, temple records. Um, to, they were they were already in the business of of mining the the long written history of Japan to learn about earthquake recurrence and um, and they were paying attention to associated phenomena like like strange waves from the sea so they they looked in those records for uh, signs of floods from the sea that were not accompanied by shaking felt in Japan nor were accompanied by um, uh, by uh, uh, storm, and and so you know you think back to the public safety message in the cat cartoons, the association of earthquake and tsunami. Well, this was a case where there was no felt earthquake, but the tsunami came anyways, right? So so that was their that's what they and they they, they were, and and it took enough loss it took enough lives in Japan that they were really concerned about it. 
So they found all these other South, these other American, loosely speaking, um, tsunamis uh, uh, by comparing with Spanish language records, uh, <clears throat> and and then they also noticed this thing in 1700, and they didn't know where that came from because there wasn't anything from the Spanish records saying that there was a tsunami in January 1700. <clears throat> so these were some of the principles in continuing that work. The main one is the woman in the blue hat. Her family name is Ueda, her given name is Kazue. And she got into this because she was working with a theoretical geophysicist at the Earthquake Research Institute, University of Tokyo in the, in the late 60s. And student unrest here from Vietnam had, had spread into University of Tokyo the Earthquake Research Institute was targeted as for its practices in, in uh, hiring people on soft money and then letting them go. And demonstrators took over the Earthquake Research Institute for two years and locked the professors out of their offices. So her, the person she was working for said, that's fine. I really like collecting these old documents. So they went out on the countryside. And then he went to Tokyo, electric power company, TEPCO, of the Fukushima reactors, and TEPCO CDO were interested in that kind of research. So, so TEPCO and, and some others supported this historical research, and, and, so, and it's no problem to go out and handle these documents from hundreds of years ago. It takes special skills to be able to read them. So you can read these. Um, they tell about the 1700 tsunami. Um, that probably came from North America that nobody knew that time. Edo was then is is what's now uh, Tokyo, and and the documents come from, are scattered along the coast. They, you can you can tell from the style who something about who's writing them. Um, this one and and yeah, to some extent this one, but especially this one, number five. It's a very cursive style. It doesn't have so much of the squash spider look of the Chinese characters here. And that's from the education level. The writer, this was a village headman. Those were samurai bureaucrats. So there are whole backstories to each of these as to why they were written, how they came to be preserved, how they came to be rediscovered. It's kind of an amazing thing. Um, <clears throat> so we'll focus just on number five down there so just briefly, just to get an idea of what it's about. So Dick Norgard could probably go to the East Asia collection of, uh, of UC Berkeley libraries and, and, and Vince Resch also and unfold this map. I told that it's 40 feet long. It's a strip map of the Tokaido, which was the highway connecting Edo, the shogun's capital, and Kyoto, the imperial capital. This was the retirement villa of of kind of the Phil Eisenberg retirement villa. This is Tokugawa, Tokugawa Ieyasu, the founding uh, shogun of the, Toku, of the, the Tokugawa shogunate, <clears throat> and he retired there. Um, the um, the Miho here is the is the is the source of the record. I'll just mention real quickly, and up in the right, partly obscured by the. By the stuff there is is Mount Fuji looking differently than it does today because in 1707 uh, an eruption changed its shape. This 1867. So so the the accidents involved. This gentleman's grandfather ran a hotel in the pine trees with a good view towards Fuji at Miho, and the grandfather had apparently had a drinking habit and and also had trouble with fires and typhoons, and very little of his book collection survived, but one of them was kind of the best of the village headman collection. There was, that somebody must have gone to boxes of, of bookworm-eaten documents in the 1700s and said, we need to copy these out and preserve them because they're particularly interesting. So you read and hear, for instance, about all the, all the details about one of, about an elephant that traveled the Tokaido from, from Kyoto to Edo, um, a white elephant that was a gift of Korean merchants. The spouse for this, 
uh, elephant had died somewhere along the way. Before, but the elephant had already visited the emperor, and to see the emperor had um, had had to be accorded the privileges that a person would have to have in order to see the emperor. So that meant that all along the highway, those sorts of privileges had to be accorded to the elephant. So the village headman in here tells you all about that. I mean, it's those kinds, those kinds of details are very curious things. And one of them, there, there are two tsunamis that are recorded here and, and one typhoon. The typhoon is from September 1699. And then this is the tsunami, the first of the tsunamis in January 1700. And essentially what the text does is it describes first the, the effects of how the, these strange waves came into the village. Then it says that the, the headman says, and I advised old people and young people to go to the shrine, which was the high ground. And, and then he says, but, you know, we were puzzled by these waves. And he's, and he says, uh, I've heard of these things called tsunami, and then he uses another term nobody uses now called suzunami, which means wild waves. And and uh, and he says, you know, such a thing could this be? Is pretty, is pretty much the way he sets it. And he says, I asked the old people and the young people, and they didn't. Uh, the old people, and they didn't know. And he goes on to say, I've heard that that when earthquake happens, things like tsunami come but there was no earthquake felt in my village or nearby. So he's wondering where it comes from. So you read this as a North American along the subduction zone where this probably came from and you have to connect with this, this, this village headman. <clears throat> so that's his place. Um, <clears throat> so this, this provided uh, a, a, a lot of helpful information for us with hazards in the northwest United States uh, from the Cascadia subduction zone. Um, the first is more, almost more of a public relations thing um, by giving an exact date and time for the event. I used to give, in the, in the 80s, I'd give public talks on the coast and I'd say, well, sometime between 1680 and 1720, there was an earthquake here, you know, and a tsunami came in, but we really don't know exactly when it was. And now you go out there and you say, well, the evening of 26 January 1700, there's a earthquake. And people say, oh, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. And then the second thing was that the flooding and damage in Japan gave an idea of how big, how much seafloor you had to displace to drive a tsunami that would cut, that would wash away houses in Japan. And so that gave a, that that helped with the the earlier problem we had about this, the, the kind of sausage, right? It favored the dinner sausage model. And, and, and so you can assert with more confidence that the subduction zone is capable of making magnitude nine earthquakes. Uh, there was an important footnote on all that is that Japanese researchers, including uh, Ueda son, uh, proposed in 1995 that they had this tsunami that would give the exact date and approximate size of this big North American earthquake. And um, at the time, we were still on our side with radiocarbon between 1680 and 1720. So David's, David's father and grandfather were interned during the war. Uh, he's, he, he went on to get a forest, forestry degree from uh, University of Washington. He worked with um, dating pre-1980 uh, eruptions in Mount St. Helens using damage to Douglas fir on the flanks of the volcano. And so he got interested in this coastal work. He was worried that these, the western red cedar out here, blessed with all that rain, would be very complacent and there wouldn't be very much stress in the rings to give a distinctive barcode that would enable them to match ring width patterns. But he ended up succeeding in doing that, and he was able to test the Japanese date. So the four estuaries where he did it was Columbia River, Wilpo Bay, Grace Harbor, and Copalis. And the strategy was you had these, these old growth, you had old growth trees on high ground um, <clears throat> from the time of the earthquake and they were on high enough ground that the post-earthquake tides never reached them, so they never suffered. Whereas down here in the non-mudge marsh, uh, you have the remains of the, 
of the trees that used the, the, the cousins of these trees that were living down here, enjoying the same good and bad years climate-wise as these were, so putting on similar patterns of wide and narrow rings. And so, so then you end up with uh, these victim trees. And, and you get a geologist out there with a shovel, you can find bark preserved on the roots, and then you can go out to the final ring and the tree. And so, so that work uh, allowed for the test and a test of the Japanese dates and dated of January 1700. And what was learned from them was that the uh, trees lived through the 1699 growing season and were dead by the start of the 1700 growing season. So that strengthened the link considerably with the Japanese disaster. Not so much of a disaster, just the, the, the accounts of flooding and damage. So anyway, so all of that done in, mostly in the, in the 1990s. And, and uh, so by the time of the 2004 Indian Ocean disaster, uh, there were already in, in, in coastal towns in Washington, Hoquiam out there, uh, these evacuation route signs, and that's just camera angle that Santa Claus is evacuating. And um, I don't know if there's a, that's, that probably in terms of practical effect is, is, is the biggest one given that tsunamis are the big killers. I mean, you think of the, two, the, the, the Japanese example, 2011, it was, the, the building stood up pretty well. Um, but the tsunami was the big cause of death. That was true in Alaska and Chile as well. So this is the big challenge. It's, it's, it's got, it, it, it has affinities with, with, in some ways with the public safety issues in the, it, with delta levees. Um, <clears throat> as for the ground shaking effects themselves, I, I was I asked this, this guy named Steve Harmson who knows how to do this stuff. I don't really understand it, but what he what he's doing, I think, is he's taking a a map of of that shows the ground shaking hazards from earthquakes coming from all different kinds of sources. And, and he's asking which of those earthquake sources, which fault contributes most to a particular kind of hazard. And so for tall buildings, um, uh, shaking at one hertz is, 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 is not very good for the building. So he, he used that as, a, as an indicator. And then he asked, uh, where are the areas where the, a big Cascadia earthquake is the, is the single largest contributor of hazard of that kind. So it doesn't quite reach into Sacramento, but close. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's, that's more than enough. Thank you very much. This, this still worked. It went. It lasted all the way through the presentation. Board members know that these things regularly die. If anybody wants to ask a question, we have a few minutes. The date you get from the carbon dating is that how you get the age because you have different layers. So how do you get the date? It's just by the carbon dating only, or are there any other methods? The, so let's see, you saw with the work that David Yamaguchi did that he was matching the patterns of tree rings and using a tree, a tree he was using trees that Weyerhaeuser had cut down in 86 and 87 and we knew the outer ring date from that and then he could go back and assign dates to those rings. That gave him the master barcode. Then he looked for segments of that barcode in the victim trees and he matched them up. Essentially, um, so that that's a special case. But you're right with the the rest of it. It's uh, first of all, it's just the layers of paint on one on top of another. As you go farther down the stack, things tend to get older. And then second, the 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 the, um, the radiocarbon clock that starts with photosynthesis. And and so in that case, what you want is photosynthesis that either that, that occurred either just before or just after the event you want to date, right? Mm -hmm. So 
So I, I showed an, uh, an example of a grass that had been flopped over probably by tsunami and, and then covered up with those layers at Willapa Bay. So we sampled those and figured that those grasses had been photosynthesizing the year before the earthquake. And so a radiocarbon age on them was very close to being a radiocarbon age on the the event. And of course, the radiocarbon uncertainties are tens of years, so that geological uncertainty is small. But that was, and the other, the other approach was to go out with a chainsaw to the roots of old growth, of, of, um, of spruce. I, I, maybe I pointed to some spruce roots sticking out of buried soils. And so you can dig them out to the point where the bark, you find the bark still preserved on the outside, take a chainsaw to them, find a fast growing radius where the where the rings stay wide all the way to the outside. There are lots of radii where they all get bunched up and you can't and you're missing rings. And but then use those to uh to date things. And then there's some tricks with radiocarbon that have to do with um sunspot cycles and they're parts of there are parts of radiocarbon time that are stretched and other parts that are not. And if you can target the stretched parts of, of it, you can actually beat down your uncertainties by a factor of two or three. So we did that kind of thing to narrow it to 1680, 1720, and that was the best we could do. Just, just a quick note, in Sri Lanka, yeah. because the Buddhist literature says that there was 2,500 years ago, there was in the West Coast, there was a big tsunami. Maybe you can unravel this, this mystery. <laughs> <laughs> I, he's making just making fun because I got to work briefly in Sri Lanka, and it was, it was very difficult to do this kind of work in the in the places we happen to target. But it's 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 worth trying. It's it's the part of it is the tropical problem of of the mangroves and the crabs. Anyone else? Uh, hi, Brian. You didn't disappoint there. I just wondered, if you looked at the Chilean earthquake, was it in 2010? Because that was strange that you you got the uh, drop in land level about one to two kilometers in land, but at the mouth and the estuary mouths themselves, they were pushed up about a meter. What was the process behind that? Okay, so so what Peter's on to is, is what was... In some ways, it's it's parallel to what uh, what happens in in Sumatra, where the islands bob up because they're sitting over the fault rupture. They're in the area that springs back up in the cat cartoon, okay? And you have to go farther farther in. So the, I guess the the Chilean idea is for 2010 is that the fault rupture extended underneath the coast, and and that that was in an area where 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 the overriding tectonic plate moving up the ramp raised the land surface above it. And uh, the stretching happened farther inland, right? And that gave you the subsidence. In the, in the 2004 case, you know, the, the tide get, there's a, there was a GPS station, continuous one, at Phuket about, it's either 300 or 500 kilometers east of the fault rupture. And that moved towards the fault rupture 30 centimeters during the earthquake. So it's part of the stretching of the Eurasian plate uh, during that very big 2004 earthquake. So these, these kinds of effects are, are widely. Brian, I, I have a question. So with the advance of the use of isotopes, not just radio, but stable and heavy, are there, are there advances in the use of multiple isotopes to, you know, you, you're able to use tree rings and growth to validate it along with your historical records, but are there other isotopes that are being used to kind of, you know, triangulate or, or use multiple isotopes to try to n nail down some of these dates in these types of events? Hmm. I, maybe, Garrett, the, the big one, that would, uh, big, the, the approach would be with um, uh, land surfaces like alluvial fans that have been sitting out there and exposed to uh, uh, to cosmic radiation that creates certain isotopes in the surface part of a mineral, and people analyze those things and get um, get estimates of how long the surface has been exposed. And then, if you have a fault that breaks or does not break that surface, then you have a limiting age. 
Anyone else? That was that was exceeded any of my expectations for this first talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending, and uh, let you know when the next one gets planned.